It's a life, it's a heart, it's a spirit. Parents of gay children say, I want my son, my gay son, to have the same opportunity to come to me and say, hey dad, I'm getting married, as my non-gay son or my non-gay daughter. The heck would you want a picture of a tattoo of a thousand dollars on your penis for? Just... You might just need to satisfy yourself sexually alone at that point. Do I regret it? Not one bit. Did I think that I would actually take it to the next step and, and do it again? Uh, uh, you know. <laughs> and what goes into their life, how they handle it, there are 12 houses and each one of those houses has a particular function. Look into yourself, think about it, and just be whoever it is that speaks to you. Hello and welcome to Talking About. Tonight uh, we have a couple of very special guests and we're going to be discussing a topic that has been very much in the news of late. We're going to be talking about um, drug-resistant HIV, super-infection, as well as some goings-on at the AIDS Center at Queens County, where my guests are from. And I want to welcome my guest, uh, Johnny Benjamin and Jennifer Medina. Welcome. Hi, thank, thank you. you. Um, okay, when people say drug-resistant HIV, super-infection, what, I mean, that immediately brings to mind, you know, horrific imagery. I mean, mm. is that an accurate reaction to it? Yes. Well, what would you say? Um, I think that I think that a lot in the me in the media lately, there's been a lot of attention given to it. And the good part about that is that it's brought HIV back up again uh, as a topic. Um, and I'm glad that we're <coughs> able to be here tonight to kind of set sh shed some more light onto it. Um, okay. The resistant the resistant strain that's being talked about is an anecdotal case. There's really only one case in the city of New York right now, and it's currently under investigation. Because of that, there's a lot of fear around it because we don't know what's coming next. When it first came out, <clears throat> this was a strain of HIV that was resistant to three out of the four drug families, okay. the, the drug classes of right. HIV. Um, the latest update that we got was that the person um, is, resp is responding to some treatments, mm -hmm. um, but he's still in intensive care and he's still going through a lot. And I, I think also the differentiation that we have to make is the difference between what reinfection is and what is being called superinfection or like the mega HIV. And reinfection occurs, occurs when two HIV positive people continue to have sex with each other without barriers, without using condoms or dental dams. Okay. And that's reinfection. They're reinfecting each other with their strains of HIV. So okay. I think we might want to just uh, kind of pull it back and backtrack mm -hmm. to n sort of a beginning overview. Sure. Because before you talk about super infection and reinfection, you start with infection. There we go. Right. So, exactly what is, it, the what's the difference between HIV and AIDS? Okay, excellent place to start. Um, <clears throat> HIV is the virus that uh, causes AIDS. Um, and essentially, it's marked by the difference in, in terms of sickness. Um, by how healthy the person's immune system is and how the person's immune system is responding to, to treatment. Um, in a given milliliter of blood, we have anywhere between 600, <coughs> 600 to 1,600 um, white, white blood cells that are specifically called T cells. Okay. Um, and that's in a, in, a health, in a healthy person. With a person whose immune system is compromised because of HIV, when that number goes below 200, they're said to have, have uh, an AIDS diagnosis. The other case that would change it from being HIV positive AIDS. to AIDS is if a person um, is HIV infected and develops <coughs> one of 26 um, opportunistic infections. Only one changes Only one. the classification? That's right. Only one changes Has that it. always been the case? No, it wasn't always the case. At one point it was two and T cells under 200, but now it's either or. Either your T cells are under 200 or you've been... Um, you had a uh, one opportunistic infection, which includes Carposi sarcoma, which is the the lesions on the chest, which was very popular, which not very popular, very common. popular in the 80s, common in the 80s, exactly. And as we saw, and Tom Hanks had that in Philadelphia. Those were right. the purple lesions. So there are a few classifications of cancers and things like that. Cervical cancer within women is one of the OIs. So that is a classification that moves you from being HIV positive to being an AIDS diagnosis, which is that the stage of the disease. So um, is it safe to say that it's not HIV or AIDS that can actually kill somebody? It's one of the opportunistic infections. That's right. That really gets you. The HIV weakens the immune system and opens it up to 
catching one of these opportunistic infections that usually a healthy body with a healthy immune system would shed. It, you know, you could be, if you have a healthy immune system, you can be exposed to the virus that causes um, any of the opp opportunistic infections, but your body will shed it. If you're infected, immunally compromised, really, then it takes hold, takes the opportunity, and then that can kill you. It's, yeah, in 20 some odd years, I mean, it's really a sad state of affairs that we're still having to deal with it. That's right. And it's also unfortunate that not enough people are dealing with it. Right. HIV kind of moved from a place of <clears throat> lots of excitement, lots of attention, to almost complacency where people, there's been, you know, different drugs came out in the, in the 1990s, the late 90s, protease inhibitors came out, and that really changed the face, face of HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, there was no longer a look for someone who had AIDS. Um, before wasting syndrome was something that happened a lot and now um, li lipodystrophy happens instead so the person instead of losing weight is now gaining weight um, but so the face of HIV AIDS has changed and people have almost become complacent where they feel that I'm going to take this medication and it will no longer be a concern for me it's something I'm going to have to deal with I'll just pop a few pills that isn't the reality of it. Um, I mean, do you mean to the point where people are saying that it, it doesn't matter if I take, pre you know, preventative measures that, you know, it's just a matter of taking a few pills and I'll be okay? I think that it's not at the forefront of people's minds as it may have once been. And the reality of it is that, that HIV doesn't exist in a bubble. Life happens, and unfortunately, HIV sometimes needs to be um, kind of brought into the ongoing life. Uh, but when a person becomes HIV positive, that doesn't become their life. Bills still have to be paid, the how you know, roof over the house, taking care of kids still has to happen. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, and a wise person has said HIV is only the tip of the iceberg. A lot of the people that we work with are dealing with a plethora of issues. We're talking about housing issues, substance abuse issues, mental health issues, um, economic issues. So a lot of times health is not the number one concern for someone even if they know their status. So what we talk about in our agency is the overarching message of prevention and you know keeping yourself safe so that it doesn't have to become a part of of that iceberg and if you do know your status is to get tested to know your status so that then you can take care of yourself and make it a point of your life continuum because it's important it's important to know and it's important to know not just if you're negative it's just as important to know if you're positive so you can continue to keep yourself safe and your partner safe right and I do want to take a moment to invite our viewers to call in this isn't a live interactive program tonight and you can call us with any question um, we're kind of basing the conversation around uh, super infection of HIV, but any HIV-related question or a question about AIDS Center in Queens County is welcome at 718-460-9802. And you mentioned your agency, AIDS Center in Queens County. Yes. Um, what is it? <laughs> I mean, regular viewers of the show know, but for somebody flipping the channels, what's the AIDS Center in Queens County? Okay. Well, the AIDS Center of Queens County is a CBO, which is a community-based organization. We provide services to people who are HIV positive, infected, and affected. So we have quite a number of services available for the agency. And um, we also partner with other agencies where we have memorandums of, of agreement to provide services to um, really the whole community of Queens at large, I would say, right? Yeah. The, the entire community of Queens. We have case management services. We're from the Education and Prevention Department. We also have legal services, um, there's a food and clothing pantry, there are housing services, there's a needle exchange now, yay needle exchange, um, <laughs> and what else? Um, I think you mentioned most of it. <clears throat> the idea is one-stop shopping mm -hmm. for issues related to HIV, um, but it's also primary, co primary care with New York Hospital That's Queens. That's right, co-located. Um, so that a person can can go to ACQC and receive a number of services as opposed to having to go from one agency to the other. But as Jennifer mentioned, we do cooperate with other agencies. If there's something that the person needs to get and they can't get at ACQC, mm -hmm. we're more than happy to let, make sure that they get where they need to go. Okay, and this is focusing mainly on the community of Queens. Yes. Mainly. Mainly. Which is a very diverse community. Most definitely. Yes. I, I believe it's the most diverse county in the country, That's if I'm correct. not mistaken. It still is. And I mean, that has to present some barriers in and of itself. I think our, our, the culture of ACQC is, culture, the, is 
to be culturally competent. We have an agency that is representative of the community that we serve. So we have um, people of Asian background, of Hispanic background, of African American, of Caribbean, West Indian, African background. So we, we pride ourselves in the fact that we have an agency that represents the community as best it can. You know, and there always are challenges in regards to if someone doesn't, if there is a person who comes in who does not speak a language that anyone in the agency speaks. And it's at that time that we use our um, networks within Queens to find appropriate services for that person who may need their services in a certain language that we can't provide for. Okay. Um, just sort of getting back to, to focus, we sort of introduced HIV and AIDS. Um, I guess, uh, start with prevention, I suppose, um, unless you can think of a more logical place for us to work from, but I mean, we've talked about HIV prevention on the show. What is being done now or not being done now that really needs to be exposed? I think prevention is a really great place to start because prevention is something that involves all of us, regardless of our HIV status, positive, negative, or unknown. And I think unknown is a status that a lot of folks don't really consider. But it is a status. But it is a status, and, and it's an important one um, because it's a, it's a status at which a person has the opportunity to go and find out more information. Um, <clears throat> With all the new information that's coming in, with this one case that's currently under, under investigation, what hasn't changed, what's remained constant, um, has been HIV prevention messages and techniques. Um, my supervisor told me a story the other day about a condom that he thought was very, very colorful, very, very nice, and he's kept it since 1989. And the other day he opened it and realized that with one, one minor difference, the health messages were the same. So not a lot has changed. Um, and essentially that is that a person, you often look at sex behaviors as being the risk, um, but the, the risk behaviors are, they include sex, um, exposure to um, a needle that's been used already, regardless to what the needle's being used for. Um, um, re receiving blood or blood products, and then um, being born to an HIV positive mother. Uh, those are the four main categories that would put a person at risk. Um, essentially, the, the, the real risk are in the fluids. So that's, you know, that's blood, talking about breast milk, talking about um, pre-ejaculatory fluid, ejaculatory fluid, and uh, female, uh, vaginal fluids. Vaginal secretions. Vaginal secretions. Um, but it's really important that people not get stuck on labels and get stuck on this particular group of people because the fluids, they, the fluids, HIV, they don't, they don't care who, is, is doing the behavior or how the behavior is doing done. Um, They're just trying to find a port of entry. They really are. You know, and I think that we all, you know, we are, we all are the people. You know, when people speak about those people, we are those people. Mm. We engage in those behaviors and we all engage in them. And so every, you know, every one of us has either vaginal secretions or ejaculatory fluid or pre, or pre ejaculatory fluid. And so it's about the HIV, like you said, it doesn't care. It just, it's a very fragile virus outside of the body. You know, and we actually had this conversation with some young people today who were asking us the difference between hepatitis C and HIV. And HIV is a very fragile virus outside of the body. It does not live once it's had contact with oxygen. It does not live in dried blood. So it's just looking for a port of entry. It doesn't care how it gets in. It doesn't care where it gets in and with whom it's getting into. It just wants to get into the body to do what viruses does and to replicate. So I think that's our prevention message is that we are all at a point that we're all susceptible if we continue to engage in risky behaviors without using barriers. Okay, um, somebody is diagnosed as being positive. Mm -hmm. What's, what step do they take now? I mean, what, is there immediately onto medications or is there, um, I know it's case by case, but. Right. There's a trend that's happening lately, and that trend <clears throat> is not to immediately put a person on medication. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is that over time, the medication oftentimes stops working properly, and a person needs to switch to another medication. So they delay treatment oftentimes until a person's T cells reach, reach a certain level, or until a person's viral load reaches a certain level. Is, is the, the medication stopping working, is that 
due to non-adherence to the medication schedule? That, that can be a very big part of it, and that can lead to resistance. We'll probably talk about that a little bit later on. But um, <clears throat> medications just kind of run their course. Um, sequencing is actually something that, that providers do with their clients, which, which is, is <laughs> the order in which HIV medications are taken. You want to take medication A before B, because you know what? If you take B before A, A won't work. Okay. okay and there's a particular order that the medication has to be taken in. Um, when A begins to stop working, as in the person's um, T cell level begins dropping or their viral load begins to go back up, it's time to switch to B. If a person waits too long, that can, that can lead to resistance. And so, and this is, it's very important for a person after they've tested positive to get, to have a primary care physician who uh, is taking care of, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, an, an, I, an ID specialist. An, an infectious an, disease. An infectious disease okay. specialist who's going to be working with them. First to get a baseline to see what is their level of viral load, and then to work out, well, what medications are we gonna try and use to set a goal for your lowest possible viral load? After that, monitoring the person every three to four months to make sure that that viral load doesn't go up and the T cells don't begin to go down. That's if they're on medication. And I think it's also, it's really important, especially if you're HIV positive, to have good communication. Have good communication with your provider and to be honest with your provider and to try to find a provider that's non-judgmental. If you're engaging in behaviors that you don't want to be honest about, to be honest about them with your provider. Because if your provider knows that you're injecting, you're continuing to injecting, you know, any substance, it can be, it can be if you're sharing needles with uh, steroids, if you're sharing needles with insulin, um, if you're sharing hormones, as long as you're sharing a needle, you're still engaging in a, in a risky behavior. Okay, so, so is there, can there be a mentality, oh, I'm not a drug addict, so this, this needle doesn't make the difference? You know, and that's where we, you know, we speak about that all the time, that, you know, it's not what you're doing, it's the vehicle. You know, it's not heroin that gives someone HIV, it's the needle that holds that small amount of blood. It's the vehicle in which it travels. So anything that's housed in a needle can transmit HIV, insulin, steroids, hormones, anything if anyone is sharing. So it's about being able to have an open and honest communication with your doctor and where you don't feel judged and say, look, this is what's still going on so that they can also provide you with services to maybe reduce your risk, which is what we call harm reduction, which is maybe enter into a needle exchange or um, reduce the number of times that you share needles with an individual. But it, you know, it's all about the communication because then that's as, that you can stay healthy in that manner because if you just sit there and just say yes, 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 okay, you know, what you're saying is correct and that's it, you've walked into an appointment and walked out and there's been no change because you're not being honest with the provider who can then maybe adjust things to make life easier for you in taking the A, B, and C regimen. So to sort of boil it down to its simplest, point you can't get the answer if you don't ask the question. Exactly. Definitely. Exactly. Most definitely. Um, somebody comes into ACQC after just being diagnosed. Mm. Uh, what's the first thing that ACQC is going to offer them? Well, everything usually. <laughs> 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 we have a lot. We have one-stop shopping. Probably the first thing that they'll come in for is case management. And case management is basically helping people get their lives back together, enrolling them for um, insurance, uh, medical insurance, housing, uh, substance abuse treatment if that's what they want. And really case management and ACQC is very client centered. So each client has different sets of goals. Some clients may come in and they may be HIV positive, but their first, um, their first goal may be housing. You know, I'm tired of sleeping on someone's, you know, couch, and I've been couch surfing for the last six months, and I don't want to do that anymore. So at that point, the case manager would then say, okay, we're going to refer you to housing. Whereas another individual may come in who's just been positive, who's just been tested positive, and they may say, well, my first need is I need to learn more about the virus. And then they would maybe refer them to the Education and Prevention Department, where we would give them a one-on-one -on, -one on what HIV is and what the medications are. So it's really... Um, client-centered as to meeting the client where they're at in regards to what their needs are at and then going from there, taking the avenues from there to find them services. But usually it's case management, if not medical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then I guess back into the path of virus. I know I'm jumping <coughs> around a little bit, but That's every fine. time an ACQC question pops into my head, I want to get it out there because there's so much information to mm -hmm. get out and we have a Hello? short hour to interact with the viewers. And I do believe we have a viewer Hello? on the line. Hi. Hi, I'm just, I'm just calling you because I think this is such a valuable show. 
I, I want to thank you for putting it on. It's very informative. And uh, just want to say thanks. I, I think your guests are very uh, well-spoken, and you're doing a great job. That's okay. all I want to say. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very you. much. Okay. Uh, uh, any viewer can call in right now at 718-460-9802. We welcome any and all questions and comments. We just had a terrific comment from a viewer like you, so just give us a call. Um, okay, the, the path of infection leading to, unfortunately, reinfection or superinfection. Um, somebody is either working through the course of meds that you mentioned, A into B into C, which now, now into D. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the factors that can lead to A not working, B not working, aside from, aside from just you've been on it so long that it's just worn its welcome out? Right. Um, you actually mentioned one of them already, which was a person not sticking to their regimen. Um, I saw an ad that uh, <clears throat> that was up. If you know, if I wanted to be told when to eat and sleep, I would have joined the army uh, <laughs> because a HIV regimen is very, very strict. And missing two doses, that can be it for that drug. Okay. Um, and it's very, very important that a person try and stick with the regimen, um, including drugs where you have to eat with it, whereas others right. need to eat on an empty stomach. Whereas you know a person where the drugs themselves have side effects that require more drugs to treat. Okay. Such, you know, a a side effects like nightmare, like weight gain. Um, okay. Liver so enzymes are increasing, mm -hmm. things like that. All things that have to be monitored. We do have a caller on the line. Um, caller, whenever you're ready, just jump in, ask your question, say hello. Hello? Yes. Um, the reason why I'm calling, I like the way you guys put out the show. It's like to give a lot of people experience out there, to let them know what is the virus is about? Thank you. Do you have a Do you have a question? Uh, yes, actually, I am a client for ACQC, and I know Jennifer Narino. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. <laughs> uh, the question that I was on, uh, that like she was mentioning earlier that a lot of people coming in for you know for medical static, they're coming in for housing, which I've been diagnosed four and a half years now, and I am on the medication and I've been doing pretty good. But the question that I want to ask that how would, how would they know if the patient is taking them as regularly? Because some of them, they don't take it. They'll be you know, taking drugs that they get used in alcohol and all these stuff. But the job that they've been survived for all their clients, they've been doing a pretty good job. You know, they help them out with whatever they needed, then do home visitation. And I was very happy and I'm pleased with it, to be with them for four and a half years. Because I was offered if I want to come in and assist with them to help other clients who have these problems. But it's every time you go there, you know, and it's like you want to try to sit and talk to somebody, they're just like, oh, they're only just keeping me here wasting my time. I need to get out of here. <laughs> you know, they are there in the street doing their own thing again. You know, that's how it is. But it's very nice to have you guys on the show, and God bless you all. Thank okay, you. Well, thank you. Um, is there any particular point that you would like to get out to our viewers as somebody who's used the services of ACQC and is living positive? Um, I would like to give this suggestion out to everyone out there who is watching this program right now and they know that they were diagnosed. Let them continue to take the meds because that's their number one goal. And they still, it's like everybody know that they have it and it's only a 50-50% chances. You know, the meds is the one that's let everyone to know how they're doing uh, because if it wasn't for the meds a lot of us would be die already you know so the most important thing that they had to focus on their meds the meds come first they follow up with it after they do what they have to do they go you know take family counseling who have family they're single male and female then go and they follow up all this thing is more important that you're going to get it done because if you don't do it is you're not suffering the people, you're suffering your own self. Right. Because you are the one have to get out there and get what you want. Because it's the same that before you was not diagnosed, you were a normal person like human being. And you are still a normal person like human being till now. But sometimes, a lot of people who have it do not want to come out and tell their family members and tell, you know, let the whole media know, well, okay, well, I have diagnosed with HIV or what's not. They keep it into themselves. 
and they still move on as a normal person, do what they have to do, they do what the doctor has told them to do, and they move on with their life. It's just another day, but you just have to follow up with the uh, instruction that you get. Right. And the most apart, you know, the most important thing is the meds. The meds that come first. You know, you follow up with your doctor, you follow up with a case manager, and from there on, you feel like there is nothing wrong with you. <laughs> because which you know that you have it, you know, which you know that you have it, but you do not let it bother you. It's just like maybe some people may have cancer, some people may have brain tumor, and they figure out, oh, you know, I'm going to die today. What the hell? I'm not going to take the medicine no more. Right. No. You can fight it. Well, because uh, there is a lot of chances out here that you could fight. And there is a lot of things that you could do to make yourself happy. You do not have to let anything bother you. Because it's just one straight road that you have to put your head on and walk. God do not like ugly. God like all his children equal as they are. It could be they're gay, they're straight, they're by a lesbian, or what they are. They, because if you cut each and every one of them hand, you will find the same blood. It doesn't have uh, pink, white, or yellow. Right. And everyone that who uh, is watching the show that I'm saying here right now, everyone needed to be treated equal as a human being. Okay, uh, and I really want to thank you for your this. input, and we appreciate your call. All right, then. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's somebody with a very healthy attitude, it would seem, and somebody who is fighting a good fight. Is is that um, a common thing that you see with the clients? Do people? I, w I would say yeah. I think I think the one thing that people realize once they come to ACQC is they come to an environment where people are not scared. You know, and they've dealt with stigma, they've dealt with things in their family, people giving them plastic spoons, plastic cups, plastic cutlery. And I think that they walk into an agency where from the get-go, from the receptionist to the ED, to the executive director, they find people who are not afraid. People who are not afraid of hugging them, of giving them a kiss hello, of asking how they're doing. They walk into an environment where people are friendly, people want to hear what's going on in their lives, the good and the bad. And if there is the bad, then to try to help them to fix it and start them down the road to fixing it, even if it's not fixed for a few years. And I think that that's the difference. It's the environment that's fostered within the agency in that they find acceptance and when they walk in. There's no, HIV is not an issue when you walk into ACQC. You know, hugging you, um, sharing a slice of pizza, you know, having luncheons for the clients, everything is done there with, with an attitude of joy, you know, and just being happy to help people and being able to deliver services in a kind way. A lot of times people have been to dentists, to doctors, to even other agencies, and their experience wasn't pleasant. And they, you know, not that things are always like happy-go-lucky, but it's the <laughs> fact that, you know, there is a place where people feel safe. And, you know, I know that AJ has experiences, I've experienced this, where we've had a client who was in severe crisis, and the first place they came to was ACQC. Even though they could have gone home, they could have gone to a friend's house, the first place they came to in their state of crisis was ACQC, which means, means a lot to us because not that we want everyone to come <laughs> always in crisis, <laughs> but that, you know, they trusted us enough to right. come to the agency and seek assistance. So that is really great to hear, though. That's really great to hear, though, the love that's out there for ACQC because we love it. That's right. Okay, that's great. <laughs> Okay, and just uh, getting back on track, we're talking about um, the path to drug resistance. Um, we mentioned non-adherence. Right. Um, <coughs> what are other things that could lead to running out of your medical your med options? Sequencing issues, so um, right. monotherapies, which happened close to the 80s, where there were very few drugs, and so a person r right now, what happened? What what? The medication is called HART, so it's highly active antiretroviral therapy, which basically means there are four families of drugs, and all, all four families are working at once. A person isn't just taking one class or one family of drugs. They're taking all four, okay. um, and all four are designed to stop HIV at a different part of its life cycle. Monotherapies were used <clears throat> more in the 80s, and that it was only one type of drug focusing on only one part. A person who may have took monotherapy well, now um, heart medication may not work so well for them because it's, you know, 
they may have been, they may have used that medication already. Okay, and it's not a, it's not attacking say the full circle. It's only right. attacking here, here, and here. Right. And it's missing over here. Or, or more, it's attacking here, and there are three other parts uh -huh. of the life cycle that aren't being addressed. Um, Reinfection, sometimes actually referred to as super infection, separate from you know super HIV. Um, just an increase in viral load, an increase in viral load, and if I were to give you if, if I were to give you an example. If two people are HIV positive, there's almost an idea that if we're worried about HIV but we're both infected, then there's no real need to use condoms. And that's, that, that, that's, not, that's, not, that's not entirely the case. Um, <clears throat> if, I, if, if, if person A has been on medication for years and they're up to sequence three, or, or rather C, okay, and they have per, a sex or you know, they, they exchange fluids with person, person B who is recently infected, okay? Um, Person B takes on the almost eight medication smart HIV, so now their options have been cut down severely. You know, all the all the medications that this first person was able to kind of go through and the medication run its course, that second person he doesn't have that option. It's not available. It's because that virus has now entered his body, his or her. So it's it's kind of like a giving and taking of virus, because vi virus, just like the individuals, is very, very, very individualized. You know, if I miss my if I miss my medication, then my virus takes on that resistance. And so then, if my partner has never taken that medication, we exchange bodily fluids. That it, not automatically, but there's a high likelihood that if I introduce my virus into his system, that my virus will then start replicating in his body, and then that virus will be resistant in his body, even though he may have never taken that medication. Okay, so say you take a, you're taking a glass of, say, water with green coloring in it and a glass of water, and you're pouring them back and forth. They both become green. Yeah. That's actually an excellent analogy. That is fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> we need to use that. We're going to steal that. <laughs> you have my blessing. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I think the, the case that was in the media, what made, it so, what made it so different was the fact that the HIV was progressing to, to AIDS very quickly. Okay, and we do have a caller on the line. So whenever you're ready, caller, just say hello and join our conversation. Welcome. Caller? Hello? Hi. Hi, how are you? Okay. Okay, I wanted to ask a question because I wanted to find out how much credibility is this to the super infection and how much do you think the media has to do with, with just blowing it out of proportion? Okay, again, as I said before, and it really bears repeating, that right now it's only one case, and that case is currently under investigation. Um, it's only one case in New York City, and this person right now, he's still in intensive care, but he is beginning to respond to some medications. Um, I don't think it's something that requires panic, but it is something that help makes us revisit HIV and HIV prevention, because whether it's this particular strain, which hasn't occurred in anyone else yet and hopefully doesn't, or whether we're talking about the disease that, that as a community that we've lived with for more than 20 years, the prevention messages have not changed, okay? Um, you, you don't want someone else's body fluids in your body, and that doesn't mean that you, ha that you shouldn't be intimate with the person. It means that there's a little more to it, and there's a little more thought that needs to go into it. But the professor messages has, haven't changed, and ACQC is continuing to get updates from you know, the, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene so that we can let our clients know, um, and people who contact us ask information to know the, the latest information. I was on the phone with DOHMH today. Uh, trying to just make sure that we have the, the latest information about this case. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to remind all of our viewers that you can call in at 718-460-9802. And um, you're in the middle of, we were talking about the glass of water and that <laughs> led to... Green, <laughs> the green. The green. The green. The green they're both green. They're, bo they're both green. There was something else after that though. <laughs> and I... Reinfection. I, yeah. I, I, I blanked. Okay. Um, Progression behavioral factors that could lead to resistance. Um, do you find, well, we kind of spoke about the, the safer sex or the protection message mm -hmm. getting out there and not being heard, but um, there are other factors that come into play now as well. Uh, for example, um, the upsurge in, say, crystal meth use. Ah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, crystal meth, in and of itself, 
does not transmit HIV. And, and, and it almost seems obvious to say that, but I think it's something that is important to say. It has to be said. It, it, it needs to be said. Um, what is of concern and what will, you know, the connection to HIV infection is people's behavior when they're on crystal meth. Right. Crystal meth, whether it's smoked, sh injected, or, or, or snorted, the, cons the concern are th is the behavior that might follow. Um, the crystal meth in and of itself does not transmit HIV. And why, why I say that is that peop a person may feel, I don't use crystal meth, so I have nothing to worry about, or my behavior may not be of concern. I, but I also think that one of the important things to talk about is what the side effects of crystal meth are. Right. You know, the crystal Hello? meth is a drug. Hi, caller. Um, I have a few questions for y'all. Okay. Okay. Um, I have HIV, right? But okay. since I haven't went to the doctor in about 13 years, it turns into AIDS, right? I want to know, do people with AIDS live, don't, do they live a long time or is it more hard, is it more harder for the medication to kick in? I think that, I think that previously there have been ideas as to how long a person with HIV would live. And right now, in large part because of heart uh, therapy, so the medications, we, there really is no set time limit. It isn't to say this person has this long to live. Um, it's really um, indefinite. Um, the per people on medications have been doing much, be uh, mu much better. Um, it's, it's also about looking at a disease, at looking at AIDS as a long-term chronic illness. So much like we would say with anyone who has, you know, any type of long-term cancer, who they're fighting it and in going into remission or anything like that, it's about maintaining a healthy lifestyle. It's about taking the meds that you're prescribed and trying to maintain as healthy a lifestyle as you can because taking the meds will prolong your life. We just there is no set time limit, unfortunately, because we don't know, you know, so it's just about how you live your life and how healthy you try to keep it and, and how you take your meds. Right. Are, are you currently under the care of a physician? Yes. Okay. Okay. And that well, is it too late for me to sign up for ACQC? No, it's not. No, it's never too late. <laughs> never too late. Well, I think uh, you should give the phone number up. Well, you can call us. You can, uh, you can call us. The phone number for the, the main office is 718. Uh-huh. Eight nine six two five zero zero. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. You can call and just let the receptionist know what you're interested in and they'll forward you to the appropriate person. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Good luck. Bye bye. Bye bye. Give us a chance to give out the phone number and that was yeah, I'm very glad that that young Go lady ahead. called and hopefully she'll be able to find the proper care that she needs. And it sounds like she's on the right track. She does. Yeah, she has. She's looking for information. Right. And we were talking about crystal meth. Right. So, so the behavior that, that is associated with crystal meth often is unprotected um, intercourse, um, <clears throat> and that may that is a risk for HIV. Um, crystal meth also causes the person to be um, high, and oftentimes for a number of days. Not so. Not just. Uh, as in with crack, the, it's a very short top. It's short, a very long short high. high. With it's crystal meth, it's a few days. It's a few long. days. Um, so a person may um, have a crystal weekend, and from Friday to from Friday to Sunday, they're up and they're partying. Okay. Um, and it's definitely not a downer. You don't fall asleep <laughs> on crystal meth. You know, you stay up, you stay active. There's some clients have have told us it totally increases their sexual veracity and their sexual appetite. Like they're up and they're wanting to have sex. So if those are the behaviors, if those are, if those are the side effects of crystal meth, then we have to look at the behaviors that occur from those effects. Being able to stay up for three days. And in being interested in sex for those three days. <laughs> for all three and, days. And, and often not partying as it's sometimes referred to by themselves. Mm -hmm. Partying with other people who are feeling the exact same way and kind of it being a communal thing where, you know what, we're both high and we're both interested in having sex, so let's do it, let's get to it. Right. And that more being the risk, right? Because th does it also affect? Well, drugs and drugs, alcohol and drugs in general. The inhibitions the and the yeah. reason. Yeah. In in general, they affect the immune system. So if a okay. person is or is exposed to HIV while while they're high or while their immune system is kind of dealing with the drugs that are in their body, they're even more susceptible to infection mm -hmm. because of that exposure during that time. 
Um, and also, it you know, it tones down some of the, the, you know, the thought process. Whereas before, if you were not high, you may have engaged in, in, sexual, in, in, in sexual activity with a barrier. Right. That high has clouded that brain. So that question of getting a barrier is no longer there. You know, and um, it's, just, it, it's just for that moment. And that's why there's, we have an internet an internet outreach that is going on that AJ is actually the supervisor of, which is really great. And they're reaching a population that, what is it, party and play? That the population, a population that is engaging in crystal meth usage and partying and trying to engage them and see if they can introduce barriers at those parties so that it, there's not the thought of, I have to leave this room and go get a condom. The condom is right on the table. Right. So the thought process is really, we're trying to eliminate that so it's right there available. Um, do you see any impact in that outreach as yet, or is it too soon to tell, really? What Jennifer's talking about is QTalk, um, and QTalk uh, is up and coming. Uh, it's an internet program that's, that specifically targets MSM. When I say MSM, I mean men who sleep with other men. Um, notice I'm not saying gay or bisexual, right. because people identify differently. And our concern isn't necessarily with how they identify, but with the behavior. Um, so you're not trying to label the person, you're just trying right. to identify the behavior. Right. Um, and we speak with people about crystal meth use, but we also speak with people about relationships, about domestic violence, about what sex means to them and where they're looking for sex. Um, without judgment, without you know, our attitudes being placed on them, because the reality is that we, we are all community, and it's important that the people who are doing the outreach with QTalk are from the communities that we're trying to speak to. Um, what we're finding so far is that people are responding and people are interested in finding out more about this QTalk. Mm -hmm. And people are interested in coming into ACQC, which they're more than welcome. And as a, as the, as a, a few more months, there'll be some more, um, some more things coming up for people involved with QTalk. OK, so well, being that reruns are forever, <laughs> um, that phone number again. The phone number for uh, the ACQC main site is 718-896-2500. Right. Okay, and you know, people can get whatever information they need via that number, whether yeah. it's th to a satellite center or, or to the, to main, the main, office. main office. They can also contact QTalk online, because it is an internet program. They can go to, uh, they can check out um, QTalkDennis at AOL.com or QTalkKiko, K-I-K-O, at AOL.com. Okay, and... Um, if the viewers can give me a little bit of time, I'll get a link to that on the talkingabout.info website so that uh, people can find the help that they need and find the services and everything that they need. Um, in comparing, I don't know about com if comparing is the right word, but um, the lowering of inhibitions while under the influence of, substance, of substances. Um, okay, that's the root of a significant increase in infection of late. Um, what is that leading to? I mean, do you think if people don't find the help that they need and they don't find, you know, if the barriers aren't in the room, where is, where is that going to take them? It's leading towards unprotected, um, oftentimes anal sex. It's leading to unprotected vaginal sex. Um, it's leading to sex with multiple partners. Risks that weren't originally planned. Um, people doing things that, that's not what they really decided to do mm -hmm. when they first got there. Um, I think people, for the most part, we think about what we're gonna do when we kind of plan things out, at least to some extent. And what crystal meth and other drugs do is they, they, they kind of eliminate that plan. And things that we plan to do to protect ourselves and keep ourselves safe, they fall apart. And you know what, that isn't a place where judgment should come in. Mm -hmm. But it is a place where a person has the option to kind of move forward and get services if they need them. And if no services are necessary, so for example, if a person has unprotected sex and but, uh, doesn't seroconvert, doesn't become positive as a result of it, can learn more about the, the, the disease and learn more about themselves and their behavior so that next time, if that's what they're, what they're interested in, they can have that condom in the room, they can have that barrier and have the plan not fall apart so much. You look like you we're going to add something. Oh, no, to I that. totally agree with him. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at him like, got it. OK. Um, somebody 
there's been a breakdown along that line and you know we are leading to um more serious forms of the virus um help me out <laughs> something i was saying earlier on and a caller a caller came in so we kind of got cut off for a second i think what made the, this this story hit the news so much was the fact that the progression from hiv to an, a mm -hmm. full AIDS diagnosis, so the t, t cells below 200 or an opportunistic, opportunistic infection, it happened in months. Typically, it happened, it took years. years. And that, I think, was a cause for great concern because not only is it not responding to the medication, but it's going from a point where the person is recently infected to a point where a person's immune system is really critically beginning to break down. And that right. is, was the, 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 the place of great concern. It was the red flag. Yeah, it, it was the red flag. In the past, we've been able to say, well, you know what? From HIV to AIDS, maybe 10, 15 years. Right. And so to have this virus in this one individual go from, from initial infection to um, yeah. a, a CEC-defined uh, AIDS from diagnosis. From October to January, or however yeah. it may have. You know, that, I think, was very, very frightening uh, for, for people in the medical community as well as for community members. And for providers of like us, like we yeah. were like, like you know, what is around the corner? Mm -hmm. what, you know, what 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 is next week going to look like? Right. But I think that you know we we all got wrapped up in that in the hype and all the clients we did. We were like all on the websites and reading <laughs> press releases. But um, like AJ said, in our communication with the DOHMH, it's it's still one person. It's still, you know, there's still no confirmed additional cases. And I think that it provides us the avenue to start talking about prevention again. It provides us right. the avenue that AIDS is back in the news. AIDS has not been in the news for a long time. There was a time when everyone had their red ribbons plastered on, and now is not the time that, you know, the red ribbons are plastered on. And apathy, you know, silence equals death. And when people are silent about a topic, it's not going to go away if you close yeah. your eyes. And you know, we talk about infection, and we also have to talk about the fact that if people are engaging in unprotected sex, they're also opening themselves up to other STDs. You know, when HIV came on the field, you know, syphilis, gonorrhea, they all they kind of were all like, oh, okay, they're gone. But some of them are not treatable, and they're also co-factors for getting HIV. So if you have an untreated STD, for you example. are for uh, as syphilis. Um, if you have untreated syphilis, you ha are at a greater chance of being infected with HIV. You know, there's a greater chance that if HIV is exposed to your body, you will become HIV positive because you have uh, a virus already working its way through your system. So it's not just about, you know, HIV. It's also about keeping yourself safe from other STDs that, you know, that could, that are not always popping a pill penicillin treatable. Right. Um and our barriers, such as uh, yeah, condoms, dental tests, is that really universally applicable? Not for all of them, except for but for most warts, of them. Yeah. Um, genital warts and herpes are trans uh, transmitted through skin-to-skin -skin contact, which essentially means that if a person has a sore on other mm -hmm. than, the geni than their genitalia, like their thigh, okay, then the barrier isn't the barrier isn't covering that area on their thigh, and that's where the risk is. Um, but other than that, for the most part, condoms, dental dams, female condoms, they're, they're providing a lot of protection, a lot more than if none was used at all. Um, and syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, those three are treatable. Um, I think the message needs to go forth that, you know what, a person can take the opportunity to get tested for those and kind of get them taken care of in another way, um, socially. Um, it may cause it, you know, it may cause embarrassment and a problem that, you know, this sore that wasn't there yesterday is there today. Right. You know, um, but the opportunity to speak about these issues again, these, uh, these other STDs have taken a backseat to HIV and then HIV is kind of taking a backseat to the other things that are going on in our world today. Right. Well, how do you bring, how do you bring it up in a conversation? I mean, without, without sounding like you're taking a hammer over somebody's head. <laughs> So, you know, is it just a matter of, uh, you can't really just kind of sit down and say, okay, I want to talk about this when you're in the heat of the moment, or can you? I think it depends. Um, I think that there are instances where a person can just totally be out there, put it out there, and see what the response is. 
Um, and there are other instances where you maybe need to finesse a little bit more. But I think the conversation is definitely important um, because having that conversation lets the other person know that you're aware. And it also gives you an idea as to where, where, where they're at. Uh, there are people who they'll get tested for HIV, and if they have confidential testing, they get a little slip afterwards, and it'll say, you know, tested, pot, tested negative, da 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 da. And they'll carry that around their wallet, like that's, you know, the seal of whatever. The reality of it is that there's a window period for testing. So if a person got tested during that window period, that paper may not be worth the, the you know, that, that result may not be worth the paper yeah. it's written on. Um, well, Jennifer? I think we should explain the window period yeah, for those who don't be. know. Right. Um, once, H once you've been exposed to HIV and it has infected your body, it takes about approximately three months to start producing antibodies to let your white blood cells know there's a virus here, it's b you've been infected. And the HIV test, the traditional test, which it can be either finger stick for blood or uh, an oral swab for saliva, okay. checks for antibodies. It doesn't check for the virus. Okay. So if, if, if I engaged in unprotected sex two weeks ago, if I took an HIV test today, more than likely it would be negative because my body hasn't had enough time to start producing antibodies. Are there other tests that can pick it up? There is a PCR yes. test that, mm -hmm. that does um, check the level of viral load, but it's only usually done on pregnant women. Okay. It's a very costly test. It's That's not free. Yeah. So the <laughs> antibody one is free. The PCR is not. But if a young woman or a, any woman period who is of childbearing age were to enter ACQC, come out positive, uh, negative on an HIV on an HIV antibody test, but there is a chance of pregnancy, she could go to her medical provider for a PCR test because if she is in fact HIV positive, then they would start the measures to keep her and her child safe to reduce the risk of um, HIV infection to her unborn child, which now thank God with all the medical technology is less than 1% mother okay. to child transmission. Which is a... Phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> Phenomenal. At one point it was 33%. So one in three children were being born positive to an HIV positive mother. Now if the mother finds out early, does not breastfeed, has a C-section, does not have a vaginal birth, and prescribes to the, the AZT regimen, which is the, the medical regimen that they prescribe to uh, mothers to be, less than 1% chance that the child will be HIV positive, which is a stride, an amazing yes. stride. It lets us know that, that we've come a long way in the 20 odd years, and we still have a long way to go. Right, and you know, the place to begin is being well informed. Yes. First and foremost, I mean, you know, I try and have somebody from ACQC here at least once a year, yeah, that show reruns quite a bit, as the regular <laughs> viewers know. So hopefully people will be coming up to say, I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You were with that guy. Nobody ever remembers me. <laughs> they just remember my guests. <laughs> but I saw you. You were with that guy. Yeah. I don't know who he is, <laughs> but I know you. You were on his show. <laughs> Jennifer, why don't you talk a little bit about the programs that you coordinate? Well, yes. we actually we have, have about five minutes left. Okay, so I'll be really quick. <laughs> um, we actually got some very exciting programs from the CDC, and they um, allow us to do some HIV prevention work with um, young women, in women period actually in Jamaica Queens and young people in Far Rockaway. The young the program for young people is called Street Smart. It's a group session atmosphere and we do uh, you know we talk it's HIV prevention essentially but HIV prevention coming through a group setting where we talk about self-esteem we talk about communications we talk about responsibility etc and um, much the same with SISTA. SISTA is the program for women in Jamaica and that also is a group type setting where we talk about relationships domestic violence issues and we you know we talk about bringing up a, a, a level of self-esteem where women can say to their partners, you know, I want you to keep me safe, I want right. to keep myself safe, let's use this male condom, let's use this female condom, right. let's use this finger cot. Okay, and we do have one t time for one more caller. Caller, whenever you're ready, just join in and say hello. Yes, uh, hello? Hi. Yes, how you doing? Uh, okay, my you name have a quick Tony question? And uh, I had a question. Uh, if someone has syphilis and had a antibiotic shot, meaning that, you know, they used to have it, but they don't got it, but it still flows in the blood. Could they still have kids? Could they still have children? Yes. 
yes, they can still have children. Um, the syphilis will continue to be detected in their blood, even though they're not, they're, not being, they're not being affected by it and they're not transmitting it to another person. So yes, they still, they, they still could have children. It's a good question, though. Yes, uh, because, you know, I had it and I was a uh, stage two syphilis, you know, I broke out around my ankles, my hands. Okay, the body rash. And yeah. my golf officer said, you know, go to the clinic, see somebody. They told me, you know, yeah, stage two syphilis, you know, uh, get in contact with the person that probably gave it to you or whatever. But I, I told them, you know, if I, you know, can I have kids in the future? Will this affect my, uh, you know, uh, you know, to reproduce, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the doctor was like, yes, you know, the woman, you know, got to get a uh, needle in her stomach because I could still give it to people even though it's dead in my bloodstream. So I, I'm, like, confused. I, I need to know, you know. It's, re it's really important that if a, a, a woman who's pregnant um, has syphilis that she get treated right away uh, because the baby can be born affected by syphilis. But as far as your concern and having children with her, if she's uninfected and you've been treated for the syphilis already, they really the concern isn't there anymore. All right, thank you. I was just nervous, you know. Okay. You hear it in my voice, so I'm sorry right. about well, that. Well, no, we no appreciate problem. the call, and you can probably get more information from ACQC by calling the phone number at, at 718-896-2500. Yeah, have a good evening. You, you too. too. Thanks. Okay, um, coming up in the minute that we have left, uh, what is the, the one thing that people should take from this show tonight? Oh, give the prevention message. Go. Which one? The overarching. We talked about it. The overarching <laughs> prevention <laughs> message <laughs> is that um, prevention hasn't changed from old strain, new strain, strain that's still under investigation. The messages have not changed since this infection began in, in, in the early 80s. And you know what? They probably won't change. And we have the tools. We have the tools to, pr to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe. This program is part of that. This, this is part of that, that, that process of learning more about HIV and AIDS and learning more about ourselves and our own behavior. Okay. So this is part of it. This is the first step. OK. Well, I really appreciate you coming and paying me a visit tonight. Thank you for having me. And us. we're Thank just you. about out of time. And I want to remind our viewers to visit our website. Going to have uh, those links that we discussed earlier, and I'll, I'll try and get that phone number up there also. And our website is www.talkingabout.info. And thank you, and I will see you again next time. Good night.